Well, folks, this video might be kind of long because there's an awful lot of information that I want to try to cram into one piece. And it has to do with draw odds. And when we say draw odds, most of you know what I'm talking about. It's the probability of whether or not you're going to draw. And usually we look in the rear view mirror instead of the front windshield to try to determine that. The purpose of this video is to explain what draw odds really represent, what they don't represent, and give you the other bits and pieces that can give you, I guess, the most value out of historical draw odds. Because we've all heard it said, right? My odds were, and what that means is they're talking about based on last year's stats and the applicant pool and the point systems and everything else, that was the probability or the likelihood that they could have or should have drawn a tag. Hopefully my 30 years of being an accountant will give some benefit in this video. So what are draw odds? Draw odds is a term that we use in the hunting space for displaying the historical results of the prior year or prior years limited entry drawings. And it's usually converted to and displayed as the probability of something occurring or a percentage that we were successful in drawing a tag. Which a lot of people will argue, well, no, it's really a probability or it's a percentage or whatever. I'm gonna use the term draw odds or odds. And all you data scientists, I know, don't, don't get on your computer and send me an email. But here's what drawing odds aren't. Note that I said earlier, historical results. Well, too many people think that when they log into their Gohan account or they go look at the state agency's published data from the prior year, that somehow that's a projection of what it's going to be in the year that they're getting ready to apply for. No, these are not projections. If these were projections, this would be easy. We'd all know, oh, this is the tag I get, what year I get it, and da da da. So draw odds are not projections, they're historical. The good analogy is it's what you see in the rear view mirror, but you're worried about what's out the front windshield. So, and draw odds being historical information, if they're super accurate, are the best starting point. Anytime you do projections, forecasts, trying to predict, and you have a data set you can use that's historical, that's your best starting point. So, you know how when you, when you invest in the stock market or you buy a mutual fund, there's the disclaimer of, you know, there's, Historical results are not a guarantee of future performance. Well, kind of the same thing when it comes to draw odds. So what I'm gonna get into here is a whole bunch of variables I want you to consider in addition to the core starting point of the best historical draw odds you can find. Our purpose on focusing and starting with the historical draw odds is to, I would say, get a little bit of an idea of what next year's odds will look like, given the many changing aspects that impact what the future is going to be. And there's a lot of things that influence the difference between what happened last year and what's going to happen this year. And the more you know about those factors that influence things, the better off that you can at least do a better job in trying to understand what could happen in the upcoming year. So I'm gonna to touch on each of these. And the number one thing I always factor in, what will be the behavior of the other applicants? I don't know how many times hunters are chasing rumors or the ghost of the big buck or bull that got shot last year. Well, they do the same thing with draw odds. They chase last year's draw odds. So that's why I don't just look at last year. I look at five years. And if you look at the Go Hunt Insider, 
That's why they present five years of layers of history of data. So you aren't just dependent upon one year where guys are going to say, oh, the, the odds were low last year. That's the one I'm going for. Well, I can tell you just about every person applying is like, oh, look at that. The, the odds were 60% last year. And they all jump in there and now the odds go down to 5%. Applicant behavior is probably the thing that affects these odds from one year to the next, where you'll see really good odds, really bad odds, really good odds, really bad odds. That's why you want to have at least a five-year window, five years presented to you right there, where you can see the trend in those five years, because that'll tell you what the applicant behavior is. So another thing that often affects this are changes to a state's draw system or even rumors of changes to a state's drawing system. So how many of you have heard in the last two years, three years, that Wyoming is going to put non-residents down to a 10% cap on limited entry tags? It pops up very often in their legislative sessions. And guess what's that, what that has done? It's taken a whole bunch of point holders who were over here on the sidelines just buying points, buying points, buying points. They weren't even showing up in the draw results that you get from Wyoming Game and Fish. But with that rumor, what did these high point holders start doing? Jumping in. And so you'd see a unit that might have taken eight points. All of a sudden it takes 10 or 11. It's like, where'd these people come from? Well, they've been over here on the sideline, buying points, kind of in the darkness. And now that they've heard that Wyoming might change their system, I better jump in now and get the most value out of my 10 points or 12 points or whatever they have. They're five points, who knows? So changes to a state's draw system, more importantly, changes that you hear in the rumor mill, often have a really, really big impact on what happens next year compared to what happened last year. So don't be surprised if you see this one year gap between a change in a system, a change in tag quotas, a change in whatever, because people, for whatever reason, a lot of people don't look at this year's new rules or this year's new quotas or this year's new whatever. They just assume everything's going to be the same as last year. And then the smart people are like, oh, look at that. that. That might change. And so they take that into account for the upcoming draw. So a lot of times it'll be a one or two year gap between when something changes and when it actually appears in the historical draw odds. Another thing that really can change what last year's numbers were compared to what it's going to be for this year would be things like changes in season dates, changes in weather patterns that result in a big winter kill, changes in moon phases, drought, stuff like that. And I'm going to give you this example. 2021 Colorado deer. Everybody knew this was coming because Colorado publishes their five-year season settings well in advance. So we all knew that in 2021, Colorado was moving their mule deer hunt way into the rut. So for the past couple years, in 18, 19, 20, people were kind of sitting on their points, just building points over here on the side. We never even saw them. In the demand reports, the, the demand index, we, you didn't, they didn't even show up because they're over here, just buying a point. Well, now comes 2021, really good season dates. All these people over here, whoo, they jump in. And you see units that in prior years, you could draw with seven or eight points, took 12 or 13 points. Like, how can that be? Well, we saw it coming. So now the real question in front of all of us is now that a bunch of these people jumped in, got it out of their system for lack of a better way of saying it, what's going to happen in 2022? The season dates moved back a little bit 
you know, a little earlier, not anything significant. But you had all these people, really high point holders, burning points in units that in prior years didn't take that many points. I got my ideas of what's going to happen in 2022, but I guess we'll see when it's all done. You know, like moon phases and drought are another one. And I'll use Arizona archery elk as an example for that. If you have a year where, it's, you know, Arizona elk deadlines in early February and they're like, man, we're getting a lot of winter moisture. We're getting a lot of snow up, in the, up on the rim. The season dates as far as the moon phase looks really good. Guess what? Everybody with high points is going to jump in and the draw odds are going in the crapper. Now you get a year where it's been a long-term drought. The moon phases suck. The herd is maybe not what we thought it would be. You're gonna see just the opposite. All those high point holders over here, they just buy another point and buy another point and buy another point. So you'll see these changes year to year. And if you're seeing peaks and valleys, you know, like in the stock market, you want to buy low and sell high. Well, <laughs> you want to take advantage of these things you're seeing, whether it's season dates, whether it's drought, whether it's weather. I'll, I'll, I'll give one more. And this is Wyoming. They had a really hard winter in 2016, 17, and then coming out of the winter of 18, 19. So in response, Wyoming Game and Fish had to crank down the number of tags in the core areas of their pronghorn and their mule deer units. They announced what the new quotas were going to be. And people were like, well, how did I not draw? Well, <laughs> when the tag numbers shrink that much, guess what? In a preference point system like Wyoming, where 75% of the tags go to the highest point holders, that means they're gonna, it's going to create a bump that some will call point creep. But even if the number of applicants had stayed the same in years when you're coming off bad winter kill, you're going to have tougher draw odds. So don't think that last year's numbers are going to be the same in a year when they have to drop tag numbers. Now, if we get three or four years out there, like it was in the early 2000s, and every year Wyoming is just adding more tags and more tags and more tags because they hadn't had a bad winter, everything's going well, you were picking up tags then as leftovers, as second choices that now take four or five points. My point of all that is, is you can have dramatic fluctuations in tag numbers because of winter kill. Make sure you're thinking about that before you finalize your application and you base it all on last year. Another thing, and I touched on this earlier, point buyers that cause point creep. So you want to look at the number of point buyers. These people over here who every year just buy a point and buy a point and buy a point. You want to look and see how many of those people are at your level and above. And I'm saying that especially for the states that have a true preference point system or even uh, a hybrid system like Wyoming and Utah's is kind of a hybrid system. And I would say maybe even in a state like Nevada that is a bonus point system. There are a ton of people who are buying points and it doesn't show up in last year's numbers or last year's draw results. But when they get to a certain point level and they say, well, this is the time, it's like they come out of nowhere. All of a sudden they're in the draw. It's like, where, how did we end up with so many people with 14 points? Well, they were all over here buying points and now they're in the draw this year. So when that happens, especially when you're looking at a lot of these preference point states, people look at last year and said, well, it took six points to draw. I've got six points I'm gonna draw this coming year. Not if a bunch of people with seven, eight, or nine points come off the sidelines and jump in over here. So we'll be watching that. That's so huge. So I touched on this with winter kill. And uh, I'm going to say 
you know, I, I gave the example of how Wyoming had to drop tags, but sometimes there's increases in tags. And I always look at the quota if it's published before your application deadline. Fortunately, some states like Wyoming, they might have an early deadline for elk, but they let you go and change your application later. Like, I think you can change it all the way into early May. Well, in April, when they complete, they call them job completion reports, which then become their recommendations for the, the actual tag numbers. You can then go in and change if your unit is went way down or way up or whatever. So one of the things that you want to pay attention to is maybe there's some years where they increase tags. And I, I'll, I'll say the, the state that is the best example for that, is both increase and decrease that you can see is Arizona. Right now, the Arizona deadline is due in February. There are some units where they're increasing tags. And there are some units where they're decreasing tags. Which ones do you think are going to have better odds in the 2022 draw? And which ones do you think are going to have worse odds? Because unlike you, a lot of people aren't going to go look at that. They're just going to look at last year. Well, if a unit goes from 300 tags to 400 tags, well, man, that's, that's a 33% increase in tags. My odds should get better. But if they go the other way, 400 down to 300, that's a 25% reduction in tags. My odds are probably going to get worse. So be looking at that stuff. So here's another thing that will mess up draw odds, and it's what I call the popularity of a unit. Okay. Some magazine article, you know, a big bull or a big buck ends up on the cover of a magazine or it circulates around the internet and people find out where it was taken. Well, I don't understand the idea of hunting for a dead buck or hunting for a dead bull, but a lot of people do that. So just know that there are some times when some big animal that gets to be really popular out there, you're gonna mess up those draw odds. If I've been applying in a unit where that happens, I just like, not this year, I'm gonna go find some other unit. And then that kind of gets into this other thing. There's a lot of services out there that actually will do an application for you. They will rank each unit by some number of stars or you know some ribbon color or whatever and I think they're trying to give people a, a general idea but it impacts how much attention a unit gets so if something ends up at like a five-star rating in one of these uh, research services or some of these publications that put that stuff out there for me, cross that off my list because <laughs> I want to go hunting and I know I'm probably not going to have enough points. So if you subscribe to some of those and you see where some of this is going, it'll give you a pretty good idea of, oh, wow, this unit just made so-and-so's recommended list. Cross that off my list. It's probably a really good unit, but I'm not going to try to draw the tag because I want some unit that's quote unquote overlooked. So with that, I could probably sit here and ramble on and add a dozen more smaller items to this list, but obviously you're probably already tired of listening to me. Uh, and I think I've given you the, the basis of, of what I'm trying to say here. And some of you listening have your own little pieces and bits that you look at that you kind of add as an extra filter on top of last year's historical draw odds. The point of all of it is that last year's draw odds, those historical results from the prior year are the core. That, that's the big part of the equation that you start from, but don't overlook all these secondary things that I talked about because that's what's going to create the change in future years. I hope I've, I've made it so that people understand that you shouldn't just look at last year. You should look at preferably five prior years 
and when I say historical draw odds, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about the 2021 draw odds. I'm talking about the five prior years. That's the true, that's a data set that is way, way better. It's gonna give me trends. It's gonna eliminate or allow me to identify and eliminate the anomalies, the outliers. So I'm, I'm starting there with five years. And then I want the best possible draw odds I can get, the most accurate. I want stuff that's put together by people who are actual data scientists. I don't want something that says, here's the simplified results. Well, the simplified results will give me a general idea of what the demand is relative to other units, but I want actual data that a, a mathematician a data scientist has put together, worked it out to get rid of all that might be the fuzzies, the outliers, and put it in a presentable format that is useful for me. I get a very common question that says, look, Randy, Nevada has five choices. They square bonus points. They look at all five before they go on to the next person. How can you tell me that Go Hunt can figure that out? Well, well, they were talking Nevada whether we're talking New Mexico that gives you three choices, even though it doesn't have any point system. Arizona gives you two choices. There is no real way to figure it out short of taking the entire deck of applicants by point level, by choice of what they put as their first and second or New Mexico, you know, what they put for their first three or Nevada, what they put for their first five. You have to take that deck of data and run it multiple times, time and time and time again. I'm talking like Go Hunt does this over a half million times on their computers. And that eliminates the outliers. It eliminates the likelihood that something, oh, well, you know, we ran it three times and well, guess what? We all know with the law of large numbers that the greater your sample set, the greater the number of times you you repeat an exercise, the greater the confidence level in the results that you come up with. That's what they do at Go Hunt. I'm going to leave you with one last thing. It would apply in any state that has a preference point system. And I'm going to give you an example. And it's a Wyoming pronghorn unit that I'm not going to name the unit, but going into the 2018 draw, there were six tags in the special draw. And I'm like, man, I like hunting this unit. I don't know if I'll draw though. So I look at last year's draw odds. I look at the 2017 draw odds and I'm like, huh, man, it took five points according to the Wyoming Game and Fish printout. Well, I've only got three, I'm, I'm screwed. Well, then I get my go hunt stuff that has it broken out below the five points. Because Wyoming just says, you know, once they've given away all the tags, they don't tell you what's happening below that. And here's what happened in that unit. Six tags go out at the five point level. There were no applicants in the four point level. There was one applicant at the three point level. And there were some down in the two point level or whatever. So now that we cleared the deck of all these folks with five points, it's probably not gonna take five points in the 2018 draw because there were no applicants with four points. And I applied with three points the next year. Guess what? I got drawn, as did two other people at three points. And I'm sure a lot of folks are like, well, what happened in that unit? It took five last year. Well, if you had the, the information displayed to you, in a manner where you could look at the, what I call the stacks of points at each level, you could have seen that was a possibility. But if you just looked at the summary reports from Wyoming Game and Fish, where they stop after five points, you would not have known there were zero applicants at four points. You would not have known there was only one applicant at three points. Look at that kind of data in any of these states where there's a preference point or even a part of the draw that's a preference point. 
be looking at the entire layers of point totals because sometimes you will see gaps like I just talked about there. And that's in a year you'll see, oh man, how did, how did that drop so much? It did. And then expect the next year is probably going to go way up. <laughs> and it did. So those are, those are things that I hope give you a chance to, to think about how you take the core of the best possible draw odds you can get, the best historical information that's out there, and then add all these other filters to that as you're trying to predict or at least anticipate a trend or a direction that it might go in the upcoming draw. So start with that. Start with the best draw odds you can get. And I am here to tell you those are at Go Hunt with the Insider. And apply this other information to it. Have at least five years of historical data. And I think you're going to get a much better gut feeling of where the draw might be going for the upcoming year. Good luck. Hope you draw your tag.